Hey, it's Obi Malafano, former safety from UConn, and you're listening on the thin side. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side or the right side. Right Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side. Here as we approach the NFL draft season, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, YouTube, and iTunes. Brian Catanzaro and Paul Pickin on the fin side here, approaching NFL draft season. And we have a special guest here tonight. Ian Wharton is going to be joining us to talk about a position that's not the top need for the Dolphins, but one that, given the, the amount of depth that, that's in this class, could be a consideration for them in the first two or three rounds of the NFL draft, maybe even the first round. We'll dive into those players here tonight. Ian, I understand as well that you have an NFL draft guide out. We actually promoted that here last week. Um, how are things going with your draft guide? Uh, th- things are going really, really well. Um, we launched it uh, this past Saturday, and uh, sales are doing great so far. really appreciate all the support everyone's given. And uh, the feedback that I've gotten from it's been super positive. And um, half of the proceeds from from all of this uh, draft guide sales, I'm going to be donating to a great foundation in uh, Cure PSP, which they work with uh, individuals with uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So I'm really happy to be a part of something like that, and and just uh, just really humbled that that folks are so interested in the guide. Well, that's amazing. And tell us uh, what is the easiest way to find the guide. Yeah, for sure. So you can go two two ways. You can either go to my Twitter, which I'm trying to not like oversell it on my Twitter feed because I don't want to be annoying to folks, especially folks who already bought it. But I, I do send out like a link a day to um, my site, Draft Centric, uh, D R A F T C E N T R I C dot Weebly dot com, and it's right there on the homepage. And uh, you can actually pay uh, with PayPal, credit card, um, or also Venmo. I do accept Venmo as well. So um, whatever's convenient for folks, you know, and you can always just message me. Uh, my email's also up on the page, too. So if there's any questions, um, I've got a sampler available on the site as well. So if you're not sure exactly what you're getting, I gave 10 free scouting reports away. So uh, definitely recommend people to check that out if you're on the fence. Yeah, and, and for those listening out there, if if you looked out in the show notes, whether you're listening on YouTube, Spreaker, whichever, we're going to have a link to that, too. So, you know. You can just click that and, and follow it, and the rest of it follow Ian's instructions there. Ian, looking here at the quarterback class, that's one of the deeper ones that we've seen in, in previous years. Maybe not as top-heavy as, as, as years past, but definitely one that's that we expect to be deep heading into the second or third round, and that's where the Dolphins draft board does come into play, even though cornerback may not be the top need there. So let's take a look at the board, first and foremost. Uh, Marshawn Lattimore – Seems to be in mock drafts, top five, top ten pick. I When I look at him, I see a, a bigger version of, of Janoris Jenkins with the short area quickness. Uh, played against great competition at Ohio State. I know you're a big Ohio State fan. Uh, so what do you think about Lattimore? Is this a player that is worth that top ten consideration? Yeah, I think Lattimore is really in a class of his own uh, this year. And you're right, I think the depth of the class is fantastic, but it's really headlined by Lattimore, and I don't, I don't think it's particularly close, uh, really just because Lattimore is such an explosive and smooth mover. Like He can do anything on the football field, whether it's vertical routes, um, whether it's crossing routes, just sheer acceleration and top-end speed, um, the fluidity and the way he moves, the way he changes directions. Um, his production was also fantastic as a first-year starter for Ohio State. Um, I, would like to see, I wish he had a little bit more experience, more than just one year, uh, but he showed more in one year than guys show in three or four years. So I'm not really too concerned as far as that is that's concerned. But um, Lattimore is really a guy who can do it all. And, and I and I like that comparison to like a bigger Janoris Jenkins. I personally went with a guy like Marcus Trufant, maybe with a, a little bit better. I'm sorry, uh, Desmond Trufant from the Falcons, not Marcus Trufant. He was a good corner too, though. Um, but Desmond Trufant, he's a guy that it's really, as you look at a pure cover corner, a guy who's really going to shut down opposing receivers, not as much as like the playmaker as maybe like a Marcus Peters was a couple of years ago. I wouldn't quite put him on the same plane as Peters was. Um, but Lattimore has every gift that you could ask physically. He's incredibly refined considering he's a one-year player. And that's one of those things that just kind of benefits you when you go to you know some of these bigger schools. You tend to see 
certain level of coaches, and Greg Schiano was an addition to the Ohio State staff, and you could tell it really benefited not only Lattimore, but his teammate Gary on Conley as well. So um, for me, yeah, the discussion starts after Lattimore, because to me he's clearly the best corner. And I think he's been the best corner really in the last couple of years outside of Marcus Peters. So I think he's a he's a slam dunk pick as long as he can stay healthy. And we know we've got, he's had some hamstring issues, so that's going to be his biggest question moving forward. And if you want additional credibility for Ian at, at the cornerback spot, he had Marcus Peters as his second best player in the whole draft a few years ago. I think Peters went, ended up going 17th, 18th, 19th, somewhere in that range, uh, was rookie of the year and I believe a two-time pro bowler as well. So uh, let's take a look here at the rest of the group here. It seems like, uh, you know, a couple of uh, months ago, I, I looked at the top five or six cornerbacks and they were pretty much blended together. Now you see Lattimore at the top. And it seems like for a few reasons, Marlon Humphrey is the consensus second best cornerback in the draft. Do you see it that way too? I don't. Um, for me, it's it's a big group though right after Lattimore. And I think that you can make definitely an argument that Humphrey deserves to be um, in that conversation for number two. I think I have Humphrey number five. But again, that's going to be a little bit dependent on scheme and, and exact fit. But again, I, I you know the difference between my two and seventh overall corners is really not much. I mean, you're you're getting a similar type of player. So I've got Sidney Jones, Gary and Conley. Sidney Jones, obviously, with the with the caveat that assuming he bounces back 100, percent you know, I'm not a doctor, I'm not privy to that information, but I, I know that if he bounces back 100, percent he's definitely in that conversation. I would throw in Fabian Moreau from UCLA as well. Um, it's just, it's a fantastic group, but Humphrey definitely has his fans out there. I'd, I'm a little bit concerned with him as far as his struggles, actually finding the ball and playing the ball. For me, that's something that really separates, uh, number two corners from number one, uh, type of franchise altering type, uh, cornerbacks. And, and that's really what most of these teams are going to be looking for. But I think Lattimore, and that's what kind of sets him apart. So I think he's going to be that type of number one, whereas I think the rest of the class is mostly number two type of corners, guys that you're, you're really comfortable starting and you want them long-term, but you're not going to probably want to pay them, you know, franchise tag type money. You're going to be a little bit more weary with that. But but I do like Humphrey, though, I, and, I, and I think he's going to be a better player than a lot of maybe draft pundits on, on Twitter. Um, and that's not a shot at anybody, but I, I do see some specific criticisms of him that I don't really think are, are going to be valid. I mean, he's 20 years old. And his production was decent, but his athleticism was phenomenal. So I'm willing to bet on his athleticism and what he shows in games, even though the production didn't really hint towards a number one corner. Where did you have Sidney Jones on your board before he had the Achilles injury at, at his pro day? So he's a top 15 player on my board. And, and Achilles injuries are tough because they're basically 50-50. If you look past it, either the guys come back 100% right away and their careers aren't affected at all, or they're basically out of the league, uh, or they're at least dramatically reduced, and, and you really don't see much of an impact from them. So it's it's a risky proposition. As far as you know where he would go considering that injury, it, it, that's extremely difficult to guess because we saw Jalen Smith, the, the linebacker last year from, from Notre Dame, go to Dallas in the second round with a much worse injury. But then again, we've also seen guys with torn ACLs go into day three so it's it's just really difficult to guess where a guy like that could go. But if he's healthy, uh, I don't think he would even last to the Dolphins' first-round pick. And it was a popular uh, pick to go like 14th to the Eagles or 16th to the Ravens. Just a tragic injury. I mean, at his pro day, not even during a game. Uh, so hopefully he gets – he's one of those players that does come back 100%, get, still gets a third or fourth-round grade and, and ends up playing well in the league. Looking at the rest of the class, Ian, so Tease Tabor was one that uh, before the 2006 college football year started was the first or second cornerback really on everybody's board, it looked like. He, he seemed to be dropping a lot more lately after running a 4-6 at the Combine and then ran another 4-6 and then a 4-7 at his pro day. Is, is it possible he falls to the Dolphins in the second, or, in the second round? Yeah, I think so. I think you're probably looking at him as a third round or later type of prospect. Um, he's going to be a very situational, schematic fit. So I think probably about 20 or so teams are instantly going to take him off the board just for running a 4-6 and higher. 
Um, the four seven is incredibly problematic, but I I think that we know he can run a four six. We watch him on tape; he has some speed issues, so I, I'm not shocked that he ran that time. Um, he's going to be a cover two, cover four type corner that needs safety help, which that fits for Miami. I mean, they took a similar guy in Damian Howard last year. But to me, the the pro day is the worrisome part because the pro day, it's not because he ran the 4.7. I know he can run faster than that. It's that he didn't take it seriously enough and he didn't train enough to improve on his time or at least match what he did at the combine. Uh, to me, that really hints towards possible work ethic issues, and I would be very concerned about that. Um, if I'm interested in Tabor, as far as on the field, if he's taking it seriously and if he's going to be in shape, uh, you know, he is a good fit for Miami, and I think you'd start to look at him in the third round. Um, pr- honestly, I'd probably try to wait. It, it's not like he knocked it out of the park at, at either of those two events, and he has other character concerns too. So he's a guy that in a deep cornerback class, just the slightest misstep when everyone else has been making the right steps or at least been holding their own to be able to to hold your own ground when you when you struggle that much in the off season uh, leading up to the draft that's a really bad look and I think it's going to cost him quite a bit come draft day. Yeah, I mean when you look at these top 11 12 cornerbacks that may all go in the first two rounds of the draft, you see 436, 441, 447, 454 and then you see Tease Tabor in the mid 46s it just sticks sticks out like a sore thumb. And hey, I I do think at the end of the day when you combine that and, you know, he's kind of a brash young man too, I, I, I do think he falls into the third third round, maybe even a little bit later on draft day. How about his uh, college teammate on the other side, Quincy Wilson? I've heard a lot of comparisons uh, to Xavier Rhodes from the Vikings. Yeah, I like Wilson, and I like Wilson more than Tabor. Um, I, I have really since – Last year, last off season when I took a look at him, Wilson's just he's a more physical player. He's obviously got the size, the stature. He can run pretty decently um, for his build. He's a little bit tight hipped. Uh, he's a little bit high cut as well, so his hips sit a little bit higher. And you can tell that when he's moving, he doesn't really change directions extremely well. Um, he's going to be a physical guy. I think Rhodes is going to be um, what you hope he would develop into. Um, but you know, Rhodes is a guy too who struggled with some of his physicality and and the ability to turn and run. And Rhodes is a better athlete, um, so Wilson's going to have to deal with that a little bit. He's going to get to clean up playing off ball because you know no one plays press every single play. So um, he's very good in press though. When he gets his hands on you, he wins vast majority of the time, and that's going to be a very beneficial thing, especially the number two corner in the NFL. Um, if you can have him working on one side of the field with safety help. And then if you can rely on another player on the other side of the field to hold their own, that could be one half of a very good duo. And uh, I like Wilson a lot, though. I definitely think he'll be a a round two type player at worst. A lot of cornerbacks in this draft, and Ian Wharton is joining us. Be sure to take a look at his draft guide. It came out last week, and you can actually follow the notes to this telecast to find out where it is and where to pick it up at. And looking at the rest of the cornerback group here, we've got some other names. I mean, a lot of them. Tredavious White from LSU. Uh, you mentioned Gary and Connolly from Ohio State. Kevin King from Washington. Uh, Chidobi Awuzie from Colorado. You mentioned Fabian Monroe. Uh, some very productive college cornerbacks. And Adoree Jackson and, and Jordan Lewis. How, how do you see the rest of this cornerback group, at least on your board, shaken up? Yeah, so like I said, I mean, I I think it's a really close group from from two to probably like nine or ten. It just depends on what your team needs are. So guys like Conley and Tredavious White, their strengths are being able to play both inside and outside. And I think that should be a huge selling point to teams, especially late in the first round. Um, I mean, you look at the lineup that the Packers came out with in the playoffs I mean, they were starting guys who ran four high four fives and four sixes. It's like, you, and then they got torched in the secondary. And it's like, well, of course they got torched in the secondary. They got guys that can't run, and that's pretty important. And so these guys all checked the boxes <laughs> at the combine and at their pro day. It's like these guys had, if they had any questions coming in, a lot of these guys answered all of those questions. So now it's a matter of, and Shadobi Awuze, too, I'd throw him in there, too, a guy who can play outside or inside. Um, so that, that's, that versatility now, when you're playing 60%, 70% in nickel, these guys are essentially starters. Um, I think they just have an incredible value. Uh, you know, Awuzie is towards, like, the lower part of that tier, but I still think he's a really solid player and someone who would uh, absolutely make an impact right away. 
Uh, Ian, you're very familiar with the Dolphins and, and their depth chart. You know, it, like we've said, cornerback is not the biggest need for the Dolphins. We've got Byron Maxwell and Xavier Howard and, and Tony Lippett, Bobby McCain. So we've got a veteran with three very young players back there, too. So not the biggest need, but it is a stacked class. Uh, do you think the Dolphins should look at a cornerback, depending on the board, in the first round, second round, third round? Where do you think the value is going to fall? So, yeah, I think that Miami should take advantage of the class depth in two different areas. We know that it's a very weak offensive line draft, and I think if they can have their way, if one of the top offensive guards falls to them in the first round, I think that that has to be a priority. Um, you know, Trying to continue to, to solve the offensive line woes uh, I think needs to be a priority, and it's a good class at the top of the guard draft, but then it craters. It craters immediately after the top couple guys, Forrest Lamb, Dan Feeney, uh, Pat Elfline, which I don't think he's a first rounder, but Elfline's a, probably a second round player. But if the Dolphins were to trade down into the second round or later in the first, then maybe he's an option, which would leave you then with the two strongest positions in the draft, which are edge and defensive end and then cornerback. And I think that's where Miami needs to get their value. As good as they can probably get um, in the first round with either an edge or a cornerback, the thing is, is I don't think you're going to get that much of a different player in the second and third rounds. So taking advantage of that depth, taking advantage of that value that you're going to find, I would really love to see the Dolphins go guard and then probably defensive end in the second just because I do think that that, that, that position also kind of ta tapers off um, in that second to third round range. And then I think corner, I think you're going to find better corners than what you saw go in the first couple rounds last year, even in the third round. Um, and now it depends, obviously, if there's a major run that goes, but the Dolphins may find themselves with a chance to get a guy um, probably not Kevin King after his uh, phenomenal combine, but even like an Awuze or um, you mentioned Tabor, even he, I mean, that's still a good value in the third round because he's going to fit what the Dolphins do. Um, I mean, if, if Xavier Howard last year was a second round pick, I think Miami's going to easily be able to find that caliber, if not better player in the third round. Ian, one guy I don't think we've talked about, I know we've talked about a lot of names here, but I know Dolphins Twitter is all, woozy over in a lot of areas is corn elder i know you had him as probably the best slot specialist in your draft guide where do you have him and what are your thoughts around elder yes i've got elder as a third round pick um you know i think he's a solid player i don't think he's spectacular um he is a physical guy um, but he is coming from a, a pretty corner friendly system like miami allows their corners to be very aggressive um, the way that they align their secondary, it's it's very beneficial to the corners. And it's not a bad thing, um, but it's a little bit more difficult when you're moving a guy into the slot. Basically, most slot, most slot corners, and you even saw this with Bobby McCain, they're either non-factors or they're great. And there's only a couple of great ones. So 90% of the slot corners in the NFL are, are very low-factor players. So Elder Elder has to kind of find that sweet spot and be a little bit less reckless at times, I think, and he has to kind of uh, continue to improve, especially his ability to turn and run downfield, because what Miami allowed him to do is just basically work downhill. Um, when he was playing press, he had a lot of safety help, and so those are things that are difficult to evaluate, but he has the skill set. He has the mindset to be a very good player, and I think he will be a solid player uh, very early in his career, but it's just uh, it's difficult for me to... Um, to really value a slot corner for a team like Miami, where Miami has needs at, at outside corner. And although a guy that's uh, in the slot is obviously valuable, a guy who can play inside and outside is going to be that much more valuable if you can rotate them in and out. And I think that's gonna, that has to be Miami's priority for, first and maybe take advantage of a slot guy like maybe Jordan Lewis, especially with his potential off-field issue. Um, but there's also guys later, too, Jalen Myrick out of Minnesota. That would be another slot potential option. Um, take advantage of one of these slots that fall later in the draft if you want to, because generally speaking, the NFL has not really valued the guys that are slot, slot specialists. So a third-round pick, I think, on Cornelder for Miami, it's not a bad investment because I think he'd be a good addition. It's another guy that can tackle, uh, which Miami clearly values as, as they added Xavier Howard. Um, that would definitely be a nice addition, but I'm not sure it's that home run addition. But you know, part of that too depends on on who's available. There there may be a huge run in that second round that takes away some of these more versatile guys. 
Um, but my guess is there's going to be someone who can play inside and outside and be a little bit more of value. Now, Jalen so. Myrick's an interesting name. Uh, uh, 203 pounds, ran a 428. So if you're going to take a, a shot on somebody, especially in the slot, you might want to do it with that type of weight and that type of speed. So, Ian, I know we're going to talk more about this guy next week, but I know when you and I chatted the other day, you you kind of view him more as a corner. I I view him more as a safety. But Obi Melifonwu, where would he rank in your cornerback draft board? Because I know you were kind of intrigued by that possibility. Yeah, I am. And it's it's just, it's one of those things that it's so difficult. Like, I would probably rank him um, probably in that second round still ahead of guys like Kevin King, which which sounds weird. Uh, maybe because King actually has multiple years of, of playing experience in that position, and Malafonu doesn't. But to me, Malafonu actually plays as athletic as he tested. Like, there was no question how athletic he was going to be, whereas some of these guys like King, um, King specifically, I think the guy who's, who's been a major riser that I'm, you know, I like him, I just don't love him. You know, I looked at him and I was like, okay, he, you can see a lot of stiffness there. You don't really see a guy who who's very bursty, and then he tested out of the charts, and you're like, where did that come from? Like that, He's not doing that on the field. So I think Melon Fonwu is going to be a, a really good prospect for someone that has patience and has the ability to slow cook him. It may not happen at corner. You just don't see guys that big at corner, but someone's going to roll the dice, and I don't blame someone for rolling the dice just because of that upside. You saw it last year with Jalen Ramsey, who obviously had the one year of experience at corner, I still think he'd be a better safety than he is at corner, but he also made major strides in his rookie year. So if the coaching staff is pretty confident in their ability to bring him along, improve what he can do best, and, and maximize that, that size and speed, which, you know, it you can teach technique, and it just depends on whether he takes to it or not. You can't teach that size and speed. And so, you know, I think some team's going to take him at corner in the top 45 picks probably. And that's probably a little too rich for Miami, considering you know what they've got to accomplish in this draft. But you know, he's definitely an intriguing option, and I, you know I, I don't blame teams for liking him more at corner than they would at safety. Ian, taking a look at the entire class and, and everything we've talked about, maybe you inadvertently covered it too. Uh, who is one cornerback you seem to like more than the other draft Knicks out there, and one cornerback you may not like as much? Well, I I, I think I probably like. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I probably like Gary and Conley a little bit more than, than others just because I would I would absolutely take him in the first round um, just because of his ability to play inside and outside and his, his level of refinement. You know, he, he's not a guy who beats himself. And he's a guy who I actually had a couple of athleticism questions, and then he went to the combine, had a great combine. And, uh, you know, he shows, he shows enough on film for me to definitely trust him. Um, yeah, I think some I think some people have him more in like the second round range, whereas I, I think he's a bona fide first um, and a guy who who I'd probably take top fifteen. You know, especially looking at like the Cardinals, um, top sixteen with the the Eagles, and um, you know, kind of below there too. Even from like the Saints, I think the Saints would be a good fit too. So he's a guy I'm a little bit higher on than others. Um, guy I'm lower on than others, I'd probably say Kevin King. I, like I said, I've got him as a third round pick. And I've also gotten Shadobi Awuze in the, as a third round pick as well. Whereas I've seen guys, I've seen him some others hype him up at, at both of those guys as first round picks. And to me, that's just a little bit, uh, a little bit too high for my blood because I'm expecting those guys to come in right away and starting if that's going to be the expectation. And I think Awuze is going to make an impact and, and be a, a nickel starter or a potentially a rotational outside corner. But I don't really see the upside with Awuze. I think he's just going to be a solid starter. Whereas um, King is going to be a guy, he has to play a lot looser and, and kind of unleash that athleticism. If he doesn't, then I think he's going to be like that Brandon Browner type where he's just going to be a very scheme-limited player. And and that's not to say he's going to be a bad player because I think he can be a solid player. But again, is that a guy that in a couple of years that you're going to be thinking, I'm going to give him you know, a $40, $50, 60000000 million extension? At this point, that's a, that's a tough projection. And, and maybe that's not a fair projection either, but you know, if I'm going to be taking a guy in the first round, that's my expectation. And those big, lanky cornerbacks tend to be very hit or miss. Ian, uh, thank you very much for your insight here tonight. You can follow Ian Wharton on Twitter at NFL Film Study. Be sure to pick up his draft guide as well. We're going to have Ian on, if we're lucky enough, a few more times here throughout the rest of the draft season. You can follow us on the Fin side on Facebook, Twitter, 
iTunes, Spreaker, and on YouTube. You can sort of subscribe to our channel there as well. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take it home. It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. Look, listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian, Cat, and Paul about to do again. We rep our team. You can't change, stop, or ruin it. All we need.